And that's my story. And it's from my story that I actually want to help others because I know there's a lot of people out there going through the same sort of thing that I'm going through. Welcome to The Leadership Project, where our vision is to inspire all leaders to challenge the status quo. And we empower modern leaders through knowledge and emotional intelligence to create meaningful impact. Today's episode is part one of a two-part series interview with Faisal Shah, the mentor for millennials. And Faisal shares his thoughts on leadership and the changing world that we live in. Please sit back and enjoy the show. Hey everyone and welcome back to The Leadership Project, where our vision is is to inspire all leaders to challenge the status quo. We're very honoured and privileged today to be joined by Faisal Shah. Faisal is the mentor to millennials. He's pitched his business around helping millennials to make the most of their life and to be a mentor to them and giving them wake-up calls about what they can actually create for themselves in their life. As you know, one of our key audiences of this podcast are exactly those people. They're people that might be three to five years out of university. They're looking to make their mark on the world. They might be individual contributors today, and they're about to make that transition into their first leadership or managerial role, and they might be struggling with that transition. They might find that they're very technically strong, but they're finding for the first time that leading people is more challenging and more complex than you think. So I'm very excited to hear from Faisal today about his view about what all of that means. How are millennials different compared to previous generations and what can that mean for our future? So Faisal, thank you so much for joining us today. And please introduce yourself to our audience. Hey, thanks, Mick, for having me. So yeah, I've, I've come from a university background in England, Uh, got a first job in a huge corporation who took me under their wing and then they had to let me go. I've been through several ups and downs on the the job market and I've changed companies, changed countries. And I learned a lot on this journey, a lot of information that I could not find anywhere, a lot of information that I looked for. And even today, I surround myself in programs, training programs, personal development books, self-help books, but there's nothing actually is relevant to what we're going through right now. And that's my story. And it's from my story that I actually want to help others because I know there's a lot of people out there going through the same sort of thing that I'm going through. And those are the people who are really, really the people I want to help. Excellent, Faisal. So you're in the IT industry for a long time. You've also been heavily involved in your own personal investments, you know, very connected to the financial markets and the stock markets, etc. Tell us about your leadership journey. What did your transition look like in that IT industry from individual contributor to leader? Was there a, a moment in time that you realized that you had leadership potential and did it all go smoothly? T- tell us more about your history in that regard. Yeah, you know, ever since I first started working at university, I had like a side job in a cinema, working, earning money. And, and I always wanted to be a team leader because I saw the, the managers that I had and where they were weak or they were just incompetent. And th- nobody would listen. And I've never really been afraid to go up to the general manager, the big director who you'd have to call Mr. Whoever, knock on the door and say, I have an idea, but nothing was, nothing was really, it was really quite cold, but the reception was cold and nobody was going to give me a chance. So I went out into the corporate world and knocked on doors, spoke to higher up in the hierarchy always until somebody actually gave me a chance to actually take on a team. And I looked at it like it's been never um, looked at before. I actually took on my first trip team when I was um, probably about 30 years old. And I, yeah, I I wanted to completely reinvent it. It was a team that had been like it was for 20 odd years. Nothing they were doing was relevant. The people weren't adapted to where we wanted to go. And I had the support of the the chief technology officer at the time Mm. to do what I wanted with this this team. And I did. I, I got some fresh blood in there, got some motivated people, went out and spoke to business and really tried to connect the dots 
and change people's mindsets because I think for a long time, from my own personal journey, I know it's what's in my mind and what I think that is possible that makes things possible. And, you know, I've got several anecdotes that I won't necessarily dig into now, but I've got several anecdotes or examples of me just getting my mindset right, going for something, and then actually getting it. Of course, you know, for every one thing I've got, there's five things I haven't got, but yeah, eventually I've usually not given up easily. There's a lot to unpack there, Faisal, and it very much goes along with the theme of the Leadership Project movement. Uh, We are here to challenge the status quo. We believe that many of the leadership practices that are in place in organizations around the world today were put in place in the 50s or 60s or maybe refreshed in the 80s or 90s, but they haven't had a a real fundamental shift towards a modern world. And you're unpacking a lot there when uh, in your description, and you spoke about, you know, that manager, a very hierarchical kind of knock on the door and very formal through to, you know, what is the expectation in today's world. In terms of inspirational leaders that you've had, I have a view that if you ask people, can you name inspirational leaders that you've had in your past, they usually struggle and they might come up with one, two or three inspirational leaders, but they can always remember those managers that they've had, and I purposely changed the title there, those managers that they've had that didn't inspire them and in some cases even infuriated them. So can you respond to that? I mean, have you had leaders that inspired you and you mentioned about collecting lessons learned from managers that you thought were doing it completely the wrong way? So tell us what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I've absolutely been fortunate enough to have leaders and managers, direct managers that have been role models for me. Oh, great. In the way that they've supported me. Um, I think actually one of my first jobs after graduating, the manager that I had there was perhaps the best manager I've ever had in my life. And that was 20 years ago. But it's just the way I had support. Everything was just, I, I messed up, of course I did. But he would jump in and respond to customers on my behalf or with me and give me support, but then to one side say, well, perhaps we could do this differently. And it was always a we attitude. And that's mm. what I loved. I wasn't on my own to say, get on with it. Now, I've had one, one or two great managers, and I've learned a ton of the information from them. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. And what about the other end of the scale? So I speak often about this uh, term that people may forget what you said, but they will never forget the way they made you feel. So what about those managers that you had that maybe were less inspiring or they were demotivating? How did they make you feel and what did you learn from that? Nick, that's great because, you know, it, it's the feelings that we, we actually remember in our subconscious minds. And for me, um, I've had managers that have been on the opposite end of the scale where they just haven't been able to give me what I want or, or actually just throw me up in the deep end, but without anything at all and expecting you to survive. And those have left a really bitter taste, mm. you know, in my mouth. And yeah, I absolutely remember those managers. I remember those people. Today I have empathy for them. I didn't always have empathy for them, mm. but today I okay. did because I know that those people who really try to, I call it banging me on the head to like kind of, I felt like I was being, trying to be destroyed. Today, I think back and I try to put myself in their shoes. I kind of guess that they were having the same done to them by their bosses. Yeah, okay. So I can relate to that. But it's it's victimization and there's really no place for that. Absolutely. I mean, it's something that we just do not tolerate here at the Leadership Project. The key points are, you know, no harassment in the workplace. It just doesn't belong. And no form of discrimination, no form of exclusion in any way. And those are the things that completely destroy a team environment for sure. Something I pick up there, and one of the things that people often say is they'll say that that victory has many fathers and failure is an orphan. And that also comes through in some of the things that you're saying there, that the very inspirational leaders, when you have a success as a team, it's exactly that. It's as a team and they promote it as a team and they tell the business, look at what we did together. And then when there's a failure, an inspirational leader will 
really shield the team and really uh, take the heat and say, yes, we're learning from this and, and we'll look to progress forward. And the less inspirational end of the scale does the exact opposite. It's a blame culture, blaming people for their failures, take credit, one of the worst ones for trust, taking credit for the team's great success, standing up in front of, in, on that stage in front of the company and saying, look what I did and without bringing the team along. So it sounds like you've had some experiences on both ends of that scale along Absolutely, your absolutely. Very good. Let's talk about millennials in particular. And we spoke about challenging the status quo. We spoke about it is a very fast changing world. Before we started the recording today, you and I were remarking on just how much the world has changed in the last 12 months. Uh, it's been uh, a rapid acceleration of change. But it's always changing. The world is always changing. Let's talk about millennials. What what is different about the millennial generation that is different to the generations that came before them? You know, well, millennials is actually just a, I mean, it's kind of like a target from anybody who's born and born from 1980s up until uh, late 90s. But these people... Uh, and I just missed out on those, by the way. Um, these people, they have worked with many of them. I've hired them. They just have a different way of thinking because there's a lot more choice on the market. There's a lot more. They're more into spirituality, into personal development. Everybody's familiar with the TED Talk, whereas before that, they didn't. And whereas before, the generations before, a company would take them under their wing like me and say, you're going to be part of this team now. You're going to go through the graduate program. You're going to grow. You're going to be VP. You're going to go and you're going to have a great retirement. Promises, promises, promises. They don't even know if they're going to be alive. But, you know, but nevertheless, they sold uh, the generation before this dream and people would actually go through it, probably get early retirement or get fired. The company would go bankrupt, get disrupted. The millennials are, they've woken up to that. They know that nothing's for life. They also want um, more flexibility today. They want to be able to remote work. They want to be able to travel. They want to be able to go on trips. And they also want to probably um, merge the lines of private and personal life a little bit more because the situations has changed. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, my view, and I do miss out on the millennial generation as well by about a decade, but I, I do empathize with them a lot. And I, I take a lot of time to understand them and, and the way that they think. And, uh, and in some respects, I probably inherit some of that thinking now. One of the key ones that I pick up on is that they are much more uh, thinking about experiences and personal development, always looking for personal growth, far more than material goods. So they're far less obsessed with you know, whether they've got the, the, the most fancy car. They're much more interested in how a new role might advance them personally with their own personal and professional growth than perhaps previous generations. So what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. They're moving into a model where everything is kind of like a monthly subscription. Hmm. So... I mean, today, I think there's less and less people who have got driving licenses. That says a lot. Um, um, Recently, the World Economic Forum said that 1 billion jobs will be transformed by 2030. In the next nine years, a billion jobs will be transformed. So that means people are going to have to skill up. Yeah. These millennials know that they can't just build a house and they don't want to just pay a mortgage for the rest of their life and be stuck in one. That they just want to be able to be flexible, be agile, and maybe they're going to have to move abroad for a job, and that's okay. So everything's on a subscription basis, down to transport, down to your devices and whatever. Absolutely. Yeah, very good. And previous generations to our generation, Faisal, there was a high value on job security and a high value on loyalty. And loyalty is a tricky one, and we might unpack that in a moment as well. But there was that thought of about job security. And it was interesting you said about the number of jobs that are being transformed. One of the statistics I read recently, 65% of people that are starting school today will end up doing jobs that don't exist today. So this thought that I'm going to have this job security, I'm going to do the same thing for life, it's not the case anymore. Your thoughts on that? 
Absolutely. When I think back to my university, I think I graduated. And my first job, I, I went to my manager and I said, hey, I just did about five years of university. I'm, a, I'm in debt. And, and I went to the CEO of the company, by the way, and, and I knocked on his door and I said, I just have a question for you. I'm using 10% of it here. Why did I need to do that? And he said to me, Faisal, you know, we, in our job description, we need somebody with a degree because it's not about what they learn. It's because they went off and did something for three years plus that they didn't like. Mom and dad weren't necessarily there to wake them up in the morning. They had to motivate themselves. They lived with people they don't necessarily like. They had to manage money, manage themselves. And they stuck for that for three years just to get a piece of paper. We know if we're going to go through rough times tomorrow, we know that those are the people who are going to stick with us. They're not going to jump shit. It kind of made sense. However, it Mm. didn't change the fact that I'm using, I've used no more than 10% of my knowledge of my degree as I did here. Any company I've worked for, I don't know how to do the job because the technology is just, is new. Cloud servers and all these kind of things, they didn't exist. But I'm managing projects where we've got new uh, Citrix servers and, and Hyper-V and all these things. Nobody sent me on a foot training course to do that. And I've got the experts on that. And I'm sitting in a room and I'm supposed to be telling them what to do. Well, you know, I need to learn how to leverage those skills that they have. And that's what I learned to do. Rather than actually learning, I had to be resourceful, go and learn about high level, what a database migration looks like, what it involves or whatever. Citrix servers, and then I had to go in a conversation. Of course, they tried, they, they could actually destroy me, you know, in, in sometimes in, in my understanding, but then it's all about relationship building. And those are the kind of skills we need to go on, not university education, but it's the softer skills. And universities don't teach you that, they don't, don't teach you how to negotiate, how to empathy, how to build your network. Where did you, who teaches that? Who teaches you self marketing? No university does Harvard, doesn't, I can guarantee you that. They don't tell you how to market yourself on LinkedIn. All right, let's challenge the status quo, Faisal. Why is that? Why do we not have things like emotional intelligence as a key element in someone's university program? And you mentioned negotiation skills, another great one. Why are we not teaching soft skills? Why is academia still very much in that form of thinking? What what are your thoughts on that? You know, Mick, we're still playing the same, we're still doing the same recipe we've been doing for generations and generations. It's the cookie cutter. Mm. It's the same thing. Read this theory, read this book. We've been brainwashed by the same knowledge that's been out there for years and years. And I have a very simple analogy. You know, we've got mobile phones, we update the, the OS. We update the OS. We never update the OS in here. How about starting with that? Yeah, very good. All right, excellent. That's your, that, that's, that's your mindset. Yeah. That's things that are evolved. That's maybe it's easy to show slides with somebody in Singapore like you. So I'll go out there and I'll reach out. I'll collaborate with them. You can be introvert and you can have a huge, amazing network with things like LinkedIn. You don't have to go and socialize when you don't drink or your cultural restrictions or if you're a family guy or whatever, you don't have to. You can do that at midnight when you've got 10 minutes. And these are the kind of things that we need to be learning, but we know we're still using the old recipe. Now, now I, I challenge you with one little thought that, that I read recently, which is in the US, people come out with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. Mm. And so, so hold on. So the government will actually lend the students money, say, here's a student loan. You can go and have a degree course. They subscribe to the university. The university is oversubscribed because everybody can afford it. So the supply and demand, the price, the university price goes up. Mm. The government says, okay, yeah, we'll lend you more money to go and study. The university price goes up. So, you know, it, it's the chicken and the egg of it. Yeah, that's a vicious cycle. I mean? Yeah, that's a vicious cycle. I wonder what we can do to challenge that one as well. Very, yeah, really uh, good. And the, student, and the students come out with tons of debt. Mm. And, and, and so today, it should be about skills, not schools. And Tesla, when you look at Tesla, Elon Musk, he's hiring people. He says, I don't know where you, st- I don't care where you studied. Show me what you can do. Yeah, very good. Let's go further with that then. Let's start with hiring managers. So let's say that you are out there, you're recruiting, you're developing a new team, you've got some positions vacant, you're looking to fill. 
in a modern day, what is your advice to a new hiring manager? How do you do that? How do you assess the right fit for your team? Ignore putting the university paper aside. What's your advice to a new hiring manager that's looking to build a team today? I would keep it really simple. It's going to be like dating. It's got to be, it's got to be, show me what you can do. It's got to be an attitude of having diversity. So maybe you get somebody who comes out of a great university, but mix that up with somebody who's perhaps not so they can bring something different to the table. That's inclusivity. That's, that's diversity. Red Bull was created because I think it's an Austrian guy went over to Japan and noticed these shots that truck drivers were having to keep them awake at night. These energy shots, it tasted like cough syrup. He took that idea, brought it back to Austria, re-engineered it, redeveloped it into an energy drink, Red Bull. And that's how it started. And that's, that's what you get when you mix things together. By having just cookie cutter people up from the same background, that's when you get same old boring results that everybody else is doing. You're not going to get the edge. How are you going to get the edge like that? Yeah, you're not going to get any diversity of thought doing it that way. Right. right. So you want to be doing what your competitors are not doing. That's what I would say to any hiring manager. You know your competitors. You know what they're doing. You know where you go. They're getting their guys from. Go elsewhere. Yeah, good. If you want the edge, mm. go elsewhere. All right. Excellent. That's how you're going to spice things up. Excellent. Thanks, Faisal. Now let's flip that on its head. Now you're a relatively new graduate or maybe you didn't even graduate from university, but you're applying to enter the workforce. What's your advice for people going through job interviews today? How do they stand out in that crowd, in that crowd that you mentioned about university graduates with $100,000 in debt, and there's many of them every year, how do they stand out in an interview situation or even get to the interview in the first place? Any advice for them to stand out from the other applicants and make their mark? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I don't want to go out of my lane, so to speak, as in and how to get a job, because that's not exactly where I am. But I would always say to a person, you need to be yourself. That's great. Because you're not going to make the grade if you're saying, yes, I can do this. Yes, I love doing this. When you, I love doing Excel spreadsheets when you hate it. You go three months, you'll go six months, but you're going to hit a wall. And so you're going to be going around the circle again. So go out and experiment with what you like. Go out and work for free if you have to. It's okay. But get out there, get experience, go and play with what you like. And you can be multi-passionate. You can be. Show that. I like this, uh, Faisal. On a recent episode, we had one of our dear guests talk about authenticity and why are we not valuing authenticity in that process more than the person who just sells themselves the best in the interview? And it does raise interesting questions about how you test that, but absolutely, we need to work out how to test for authenticity to make that part of the recruitment decision and look for those attitude and aptitude approaches and the authentic person that's going to really tell us who they really are. I I think that's wonderful advice. And a lot of it comes from self-marketing. You need to know how to market yourself. This is a key skill. If you can know how to market yourself, and information's out there for free, by the way, you pick one, by the way, don't pick 10, Um, pick one. And go on tools like LinkedIn, like whatever platform, professional platform you like. Um, Join Clubhouse rooms. Mm. Whatever you need to do, just listen, participate, and market yourself. Know who you are. Just a sentence that really makes sense so people know, boom, this is this person. And, And that's really important. Can I challenge you there a little bit? Sure. I just want to add one word to what you said, market who you are. Can I say market who you really are? And that's where the authentic comes in. So don't just put on a show of this is me and I'm great and I'm the best candidate for this role because of blah, blah, blah. Market who you really are and what your motivations are, what your personal why is all about. And that speaks volumes of the person's character in my view. What are your thoughts about that? Market who you really are. Yeah. Absolutely. That's exactly what, what I would want to do. I mean, for me, there's no other option. Um, yeah. You need to do that. And if you like tinkering with whatever at the weekends, it's okay. 
Mm. I mean, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there's a, in my CV applications, there's like hobbies at the bottom. And I put, oh, I like to travel and all that. But yeah, it was always something, I always put something crazy to get, to grab attention. And sometimes it did. The guy would say, oh, you visited there? I visited there. And that boom, ah, very we, good. We, instant, yeah. we had rapport. But now it's gone beyond that, you know. And also, um, 12 years ago, I was, when I was interviewing candidates, I was already looking at their Facebook. Yeah. I was always seeing what there was. And if I saw somebody dressed like a Viking at an airport, and then he's saying something completely different on his CV, but his Facebook photos, I mean, that actually, that's a real example, by the way. Oh, right. I was like, <laughs> nah. <laughs> yeah. So you need to, you need to clean it up. Okay. You can have crazy, you can have authentic and all that, but there is a place for everything and you need to clean it up because everything's out there and yeah. the true you will come out. Yeah, so if that's you, that's fine. Yeah. But, but make sure, make sure it's genuine. And if you want to swear at somebody online, it will come out. So be careful about what you say. Yeah. Okay. Good. As if you were down the street. Hey, excellent, Faisal. And, and getting back to the uh, authenticity, if you are authentic in that process, then let's say that you get the job, then all you've got to do is turn up and be yourself every day. You don't have to put on a show and have this persona that, that you're uh, portraying every day when you arrive at the office or the virtual office now, that you don't have to put on a show anymore. You, you were recruited for who you are. So now all you need to be is be who you are and be the best version of who you are every single day. Absolutely. Um, imagine that. You get paid for showing up and being who you are. There we go. I love it. Wow. Wow. You've been listening to The Leadership Project. That ends part one of our two-part series with Faisal Shah. Join us again soon for part two as Faisal continues to share his story, including his own transition into leadership roles and how he ended up becoming the wake-up mentor for millennials. If you're enjoying the show, please do go ahead and leave us a rating on, on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify or wherever you're listening to us. And don't forget to hit subscribe so you're informed of all future episodes. And we'd love it if you could leave us a comment or any questions that you might have for us uh, to explore on the show and to tell your friends. In the meantime, please do stay safe, look out for each other, and always remember to challenge the status quo.